I start then? I don't hear anyone. You guys still hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you. Okay, very good. So this talk is uh, what belongs in a robot's brain. I'm not sure completely, but but that's the, the topic. Um, introduction. So um, in this talk, there's going to be kind of a Goldilocks principle. If you know the, the story of Goldilocks, I am um, looked up. The, the name. Um, so, you know, Goldilocks goes into the different parts of um, the house and, you know, one of the, the, the porridges there is too hot and one is too cold and one is just right. And, you know, the bed is too hard or too soft and one is just right. So kind of what's just the right amount to put into a robot's brain that's not too much, but is um, going to be just enough. So it'll be necessary and sufficient at some level. And if you take away something, then it's too little. Um, so if you imagine a, a robot vacuum cleaner, um, there's a big robot brain that may have a perfect exact map of everything that's going on, or a kind of complete model, or another one that's maybe just kind of toggling some bits inside of its memory, and that's about all that it needs. So, um, and, and maybe it can do something interesting, maybe it can't, and that's the kind of thing we want to know. So, um, since I'm talking to a, a math institute, um, I think that um, I, this is a sort of mathematically centered kind of talk in the way that I'm looking at things. And so, I like to look at four different levels in this talk. So there's what I'll call strong geometry, um, which can be things like, um, you know, metric spaces, differential manifolds, algebraic geometry, these kinds of things are coming into play. Then what I call weak geometry, which is um, combinatorial kinds of information. So there may be event-based kinds of things that are happening. Um, weak geometry in the sense that maybe one object is to the left or the right of the other, but I don't know how far away they are, or what the angles are, any particular metric information. So that'll be weak geometry. Then there's topology, where um, things like topological manifolds, concepts of homeomorphism, and homotopy, these kinds of things are, are relevant. And then at the most kind of general level, um, we have set theory, where we're just talking basic mapping. Maybe I'm not going to talk about category theory, but just generally speaking, um, we have sort of the most general kind of case. And as we move in these different levels of, of let's say, mathematics or, or levels of generality here, if they're used for modeling, then I want to think about what makes two different spaces equivalent. It's always fascinating in mathematics when you declare something to be equivalent. Like in group theory, you declare two groups to be equivalent, but you know one of them may have kind of looked like it was represented with matrices, another one was represented with something else, but they're isomorphic, and so the isomorphism identifies the fact that they're the same group. It's homeomorphism and topology. And, and so forth and so on. You have this kind of idea. In, in set theory, you're very interested in whether or not there's a bijective mapping between two sets, and that's that's all you really need. So um, often in engineering, it, it gets kind of, I feel like generality kind of almost runs backwards. People feel like the mathematical models that have more structure are more general, but it's usually the other way around. And, and if you think about it kind of mathematically, um, the ones with less structure are actually more general. So set theory, say you use um, ZF set theory, or mellow frankel set theory, there's once you have those axioms down, you don't need uh, anything else really, and you just start doing your operations. Um, and there's always this kind of question in, in robotics about when are probabilistic models appropriate, which um, I will not go into too much here, but uh, but but I think what I'll talk about is somewhat perpendicular to that. So so it's um, not to ignore it completely, but it's sort of a side thing in some ways. So the robot and its environment. So um, so we think about there's a physical world, and then there's a robot's brain, so to speak. Of course, I mean computation. I don't mean it's like, it doesn't have to be some neural kind of thing, but, but some kind of computational device. And then there's sensing that goes on from the physical world to the robot brain and then actuation, uh, commands that are given actions by the robot. So that means there's an external space, which has things like configuration variables, phases, object properties, and then there's an internal information space. Um, so X for external and I for internal or information space. One thing to pay attention to here, and I think it's very easy to get this confused in, in robotics. I, I've been confused myself for many years about many things, but, but, but this one even in particular being a roboticist, which is um, there's the robot's view versus like, let's say the God's view. And we are behaving sort of like gods if we can see the entire picture. And if we define the state space X, and we talk about a space of possible um, configurations or even a space of possible configuration spaces, it could be a space of spaces, that's fine. Then, um, um, we, we, we're taking a kind of God's view, and we're doing that for the purpose of analysis. We want to prove that the robot will accomplish something, or maybe prove that it can't accomplish something. But that doesn't mean the robot does not mean the robot has that same view. So, um, so the robot's view, the robot can be quite limited, but we as gods can prove that it will work in this scenario and not work in a different scenario. So that, that's why it's important to keep these two things uh, straightened out. 
So, and, and the external state space, I will say, does not necessarily behave like a nice Turing tape. So just because I describe a, a, an external state space, it does not mean that I'm putting all that into a computer. So I'm not writing it down in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a on a um, in memory or on a Turing tape or something like that. And, and also one thing that will become hopefully clear in this talk is that it's not necessary for the robot to store something like a digital twin of its environment. If you heard that kind of maybe a lot of um, a lot of computing research on creating digital twins these days and such, trying to mirror exactly what's out in the physical world inside the, the computation system. And, I, and what I want to say is it's certainly not necessary to do that. Um, so you have a couple dynamical system. You have uh, X goes to Y through some mapping H. That's a sensor mapping. I'm assuming you can see my pointer. Hopefully you can, because this is the screen that's sharing. So it, I think it should work. And then um, the um, from the internal, there's an information state, and that maps using some mapping pi. Let's say that could be a plan or policy. So you can imagine P for that, or pi, P pi policy, all of that. And then uh, you apply pi, and you get um, an action, which generates could generate forces or some kind of energy in the physical world, and and then that that causes the state to change and then this whole thing keeps getting kind of measured and it cycles again and again. So notice that it has a beautiful kind of symmetry to it. There's X to Y and I to U. Uh, big U is a set of possible actions and big Y is a set of possible sensor observations. And you can see it's a, it's a kind of coupled dynamical system. So there's, there's um, X, X prime. This is, a, this is kind of a discrete time looking formulation or event driven formulation here, but you can use differential equations if you like. It, it's all fine. I'm not going to be able to cover all of those variations in this talk. So you have um, next state is a function of current state and action. And then down here you have next information state is a function of the current information state and observation. You have these mappings here, which are indicated by these boxes. And then um, here, this shows how the mapping applies when you have a particular policy fixed and a particular sensor mapping fixed. Then you can see that X prime is really a function of X and I, and I prime is a function of I and X. So that really connects them together beautifully. Uh, when I talk about information in this talk, I'm talking about the von Neumann, uh, famous mathematician von Neumann, um, Morgenstern style of information from dynamic game theory, not uh, Claude Shannon's much more popular, especially in engineering, um, information theory. So I'm not going to talk about bits and entropy and all of that stuff. It's, it's, it's fascinating enough topic, but it gets enough coverage. I don't need to cover that today. Um, so I'm talking more about information spaces from dynamic game theory. So imagine there's a couple of players playing a game, player one, player two. They have different choices. This is a tree of possibilities. And at the end, there's some kind of payout for one of them. The other one gets negative of that payout, suppose. Well, um, these circles here correspond to the set of possible states. Like if, if player two does not know what action player one took, then there's these two possibilities here in, inside this loop. So there's a set of possible states that, that, that you might be at, that the game might be at um, during operation. And the players nevertheless have to uh, make choices. So it's more about hidden information, not bits. And, and so it could be bits, but it's kind of an independent notion. So the idea of hidden information, it's very important for robotics because robots are not expected to go around and measure everything unless you're kind of obsessive and you want to do it anyway, but, but they, don't, they don't need to do that. So it's more, the robot's problem is more like playing a game of battleship or, or a blind uh, chess. Uh, um, so, so playing a chess game where you can't actually see where the pieces are. Um, a lot of military operations are like that and, and yes, robotics. Um, there's other names for these, but if, if in AI you see the word belief states a lot, that's in a probabilistic setting. Um, other names like knowledge states, hyperstates have been around, but I, I like the information states because it goes all the way back um, almost a century. So the idea, there's these history information states, which basically is like a trace of everything going on in this diagram. So, so what are all of the observations that are coming in and what are all the actions that are going out? And if we gather all that up, it looks like a really long list. Maybe some initial conditions are here, but it's a really long list, let's say, or sequence. It's a growing sequence. And in continuous time, if you want to make a continuous time formulation, then these are time parameterized functions that give you actions and observations. So the history information space, or I space for short, is the set of all these possible uh, histories. So that's a huge space. But what's nice about it, if you pretend that it's not huge, is you can write a nice little mapping like this. And you can say that the policy of the robot should be mapping history to action. So for one history, it'll do one thing. For another history, it'll do something else. And now you start to wonder, what if you have two different histories and you think really it doesn't matter which one of the two histories you're in, you should do the same action, right? So that, that's, that gives you the, the feeling like something ought to be reduced here. We'd like to reduce it to make simpler um, information spaces. And that'll lead to simpler kinds of feedback, information feedback for the robot. 
So going back, this is some stuff that's covered in my planning algorithms book back in 2006. Um, we construct information mappings that map this history down to something smaller, some kind of derived information space. And then we use that derived information space, some smaller space. We expect large pre-images in this mapping. So many histories will map to the same derived information state or derived I state. So we define a plan as um, a mapping from these derived information states to action. There's many examples of this in, in literature. Um, one of the most common is what's done in control theory typically, which is to, um, to do state estimation. So you take this history and you map it to the state space. You're trying to estimate the state. Um, you could have just time feedback. You just take the history and you figure out what time it is. So you just ignore all the observations and actions that have been applied in particular. Maybe you just know how many steps have been, you've been going at this discrete time, or you know the exact time, or maybe it's, it's only an estimate of the time. You can have sensor feedback. Just look at the last observation, and that's all you get. And just throw away all the rest. Um, these uh, Breitenberg, Breitenberg vehicles, there's a whole book about these, um, 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 use simple sensor feedback like this. Um, limited memory, just like a sliding window of, you know, forget everything that happened more than five seconds ago. So there's like no long-term memory for the robot. Um, deterministic reasons about, non-deterministic, sorry, reasons about the set of possible states. And probabilistic reasons about probability distributions over possible states. And one very beautiful special case of that that gets a lot of use in engineering work is in robotics. Well, it's the common filter. In that case, um, the probability distributions are all limited to being Gaussian, and um, um, and it, it arises only in the case of linear systems and linear observations and and Gaussian uh, noise applied to both of those. So, when reducing information spaces, there's a very important idea called sufficiency. So, up here, I have, I have a, I'm, I'm in I have a particular history, and then I have a mapping that goes to the next history, and it just adds the current action and observation, and then you get another action observation. And you imagine moving along the diagram like this from left to right. And then when you apply this mapping kappa, you'd like to live in this lower space here, this derived information space. And in order to live there, you'd have to be able to get from this derived one to this derived one, from the first one to the second one, without going back up and looking at the history, because it's been thrown away. Everything's been mapped down. So it's a kind of commutativity in this commutative diagram that has to be satisfied to do that. If I, for example, back here, just made kappa be the estimate of state, usually the estimate of the state is not sufficient to figure out the next estimate of the state using only the current measurements. In the, in the common filter, you need um, the covariance and the mean. The mean is the estimate of state, and you need the covariance. Once you have those two, then you can transition to the next information state. So, so, so that would be an example of how it works in the common filter. So, so that's an idea of sufficiency. And um, what we want to know, I think what I would like to know theoretically, and we have some very recent work on that in the current year um, presented, it's, it's in a journal of, in the Frontiers in Neurorobotics and Neuro, Neuro, I think it's Neurorobotics, that's not Neurobotics, right? now that I finally read my slides. And um, also um, th there's, a, there's a paper at the, the Wafer Workshop and uh, we're preparing an invited uh, International Journal of Robotics research version that's expanded on that, so hopefully we'll have that out in a couple of months. But, um, um, but basically, we, we showed in a very general setting, really general setting, that this, there's a minimal information space, and it always exists and is unique, which I think is, is really fascinating, a little bit of a surprise to me, in fact. Um, so in, the, in a very, very general setting, that's only using basic sets and mappings and uh, reasons about hierarchies of, of partitions, which I'll come to in a little bit later in the talk. So um, but we're very excited about that. It's been some of the first new results on, on information space sort of kind of generalities since, since uh, some of the things that I wrote in my book in 2006. So finding the right information space is the challenge. One way to formulate the robotics problem that in a way that doesn't look like a computer science problem. It's not a machine learning problem. You could apply machine learning to it, but ultimately you'd like to know what, what's the ideal thing to learn. Then. Either you have an algorithm generate a plan or you can have an algorithm do learning, whatever you want to do with it, but you ultimately want to figure out kind of what's the right kind of structure or representation. What does the robot need to have in its brain? and not uh, predetermined as, okay, it's gonna have a deep neural network and we have to tune the right parameters. I, does it even need to have a neural network in its brain? Probably not. I can give many examples where it does not need to have all of that. So, so, so I wanna know how much memory is sufficient, what internal representations are necessary. And um, you know, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a full range from, from sensor feedback, which just forgets information altogether, only uses the current sensor to minimal sensors to, um, and minimal filters, sorry, to just full you know, state feedback. Um, I, I like to think the, the environment itself, the external world, it's kind of like a big hard drive or cloud, if you want. 
And um, all the information you need is kind of there, but you can only read and write to it with sensing and actuation. So it's kind of limited because um, on, on an actual hard drive or cloud, you can put the data there and get it back again perfectly most of the time. But, um, but for sensing and actuation, it's not like that. It's a big sloppy mess. You can only measure certain things from the environment and they change all the time. Actuation does its best to change the environment, but it might not do exactly what you want it to do. So, so I would say that there's no need to sense everything and create some artificial big data problem if you don't need to. And in that case, you might end up with a better robot, even something that's a better product in practice because it's much cheaper to make. It doesn't have such, it will not have such high sensing and memory requirements. So let's look at the four levels from this kind of perspective. So strong geometry is kind of what I grew up with. I, I, I fell in love with the motion planning problem around 1990, 91. My advisor, Seth Hutchinson, um, got a hold of Jean-Claude Latome's uh, motion planning book, the early drafts of it, and even Jean-Claude Latome himself visited, and I got really excited about the problem. I had been working on computer vision at the time, a bunch of uh, statistical Bayesian image segmentation stuff, which was okay about it, Monte Carlo things. And, I found most of it kind of boring, though this was much more exciting. So, so, so I worked on these kinds of problems. And um, this is a, it's a virtual robots actually moving a model of a piano. It's often called the piano movers problem. But in this case, it's assumed that you're given a complete geometric model of the physical world. So this would be as if you put in the robot's brain a complete capture of everything. Now, in the 1970s, 80s or so, and 90s, when I got started in the early 90s, it was a little bit ridiculous to assume that you have this much of a model. Well, these days you can do SLAM and build eh, pretty good models. So uh, you can build three-dimensional models or four-dimensional models, including time. And uh, we can kind of pretend that we know everything. Um, there's a very good mapping systems right now. And one of the biggest markets for that is the real estate industry. Everyone wants to map out their homes and buildings and things for real estate, especially if it's a pandemic and you can't go step inside for real. So. Um, one of the key steps is that, well, even though you have a complete representation, you may have a model of everything like this. In terms of the space of transformations, you still don't know which transformations are allowed. How can I move my robot so that it goes from point A to point B without hitting things? So that's the basic motion planning problem, moving a piano from one place to another or a robot from one place to another without hitting anything. And so it's really nice, uh, uh, Lozano Perez at, at MIT, uh, we often consider him to be, to be the founding or one of the founding fathers of, of robot motion planning with this key idea of using this, I, uh, borrowing the space essentially from Lagrangian mechanics, this idea of a configuration space of a rigid body. And then you can also attach multiple rigid bodies together and kind of describe any, any robot you want. So you can have flexible robots and all kinds of things. But abstractly speaking, you want to go from point A to point B on some configuration manifold. Okay, maybe it's there's more general things than just that, but, but that's, that's what you typically have. And then there's some bad places, and you can avoid the bad places using collision detection, um, doing collision detection. So we have a, a lot of different ways to, to approach these kinds of things. Um, there are um, semi, there, there's, there's uh, algebraic methods um, which perform, um, they, they work in the area of, of computational real algebraic geometry. So it's algebraic geometry that's going on there, um, where you can do a kind of a cell decomposition. These methods were developed for determining satisfiability of Tarski sentences. So it's very close to logic and, and algebra in a, in a very nice way. Um, they're not too practical, but, 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 but um, fascinating to learn about. And they're very, very general. So there's very general solutions for solving the problem of getting from point A to point B, deciding whether a solution exists given an exact, complete, perfect representation. Um, there's also a lot of sampling-based motion planning methods like this RRT thing here. Um, James Kupfer and I introduced RRTs 20 or 30 years ago. 20, well, some number of years ago, I don't remember, 20 something years ago, and uh, 1998. And, and so, um, and uh, um, anyway, it's been used a lot as probabilistic roadmaps and many, many other methods of doing uh, sampling based planning. And um, you can also imagine when you have a complete sort of description of the, of the manifold, you can also do all kinds of calculations, numerical methods over the manifold. You can do a value iteration and um, optimal control things. Um, called reinforcement learning these days, mostly optimal control inside of there. So there's a lot of things you can do over the, over the manifold as well. You have a complete uh, kind of geometric representation of it. Uh, all of those are examples of what I would call big brain robots. So the, the robot's information space is huge in that case. And this reminds me of something from Philosophy of Mind by Daniel Dennett, this idea of a Cartesian theater. Um, it's kind of thought experiment where people seem to, based on their statements, imagine 
that with human vision, when you see something, it's as if there's a movie screen inside the head and all of the things that the eye sees is actually must be in the head somewhere. People seem to believe that for a while, or at least they make statements that would imply that this would, that this kind of must be happening. Um, and I think we know that that with, with um, sort of modern neuroscience and cognitive science, we, we know that that's ridiculous, that it's, the brain is not doing that, of course. So much information is lost just by the time you get from the eye to the optic nerve. So it's, there's no way um, all of that is going on. So, so somehow the brain has figured out what really needs to be modeled so that we interact or enact with the world um, in, in, in a way that's sufficient for whatever we're trying to achieve, which hopefully is survival and maybe some reasonable level of happiness if it's not too much to ask. So, um, so, so, so this looks like you know, building, building very, very strong models. So what I wanna say is, um, you know, why would you wanna build the theater and then discard all the information or do a huge amount of computation over it. Why don't you <clears throat> figure out judiciously what's really needed and then make decisions based on that? So that leads us into weak geometry. And I'm going to highlight some different works that, that we did. Um, very many of these works are connected to Rafael Murrieta and his students over the over many years. So th this is in fact Benjamin Tovar, it's part of his, his work. Uh, Luigi Freda was an Italian visitor who came also as well. I think from Sapienza. Um, but um, here, imagine you have a robot in the middle here, and it's out in a big field, and there are these landmarks, like towers or something, and they're all uniquely numbered. And then the sensor reading is just a cyclic ordering of the towers. So it's only combinatorial. There's no distance information, and there's no angular information. It's just a cyclic order. I don't even know where the cycle starts or ends. And you tell the robot, uh, the, the robot has commands that can be given, and it just says commands like go to landmark I. So they can say go to nine and then it'll go zoop and move over to nine or go to one, then it moves over to one. So, um, so that's what we have. What we showed for that problem is that um, with, with, with very small amount of work, it can determine which landmarks are in or out of a triangle formed by any other landmark. So I should probably say it differently. Pick any three landmarks and I can, it, it can determine which of the other landmarks are inside that triangle or outside. And more generally, it can figure out um, um, taking any, con taking the convex hull of any subset of landmarks, it can tell whether other landmarks are in that hull or out. Um, this is um, equivalent to, as computational geometers know, um, which I'm not going to emphasize here, of, of learning the, the dual line arrangements. So, so it's a very important kind of piece of information. It's closely related to, um, well, it has convex hulls in it, and it's related to um, Voronoi diagrams and, and Bellani triangulations, as I'll mention in a little bit. Um, it actually surprised one of our one of my computational geometry colleagues once because um, he thought it would be impossible to do this efficiently, but it turns out it can be hard to decide whether or not a certain arrangement of points is realizable that has a certain pattern of, of convex hull uh, inside and outside queries, but that, that's very hard to do. But this is already realizable because a robot has measured it, so, so it, it, you don't have to test for realizability. You're given that it's realizable, and you just have to figure out what the arrangement is. Um, there's also braid structures here. If you, if you, um, when you go moving around, this, the cyclic permutation will start changing. But what if you knew whether one landmark was passing in front of another or behind? If you had that extra information, it starts making braids, like braiding hair. And so if you're a, a fan of group theory, then you end up with braid groups and you can start studying that if you like. I, we, we went down that path for a little while. Um, personally, I, I did not find it generating too many interesting things, but there are Lie algebras hiding under there that are pure group theoretically algebra that sort of relates to things that look like um, um, spectral or Taylor series like representations of groups, uh, non commutative groups and stuff. Very interesting things there, but, but, um, but we never, I wouldn't say it got too useful still, but, but it's, it's an interesting observation. <clears throat> then we had um, my student, Maxim Katsev. Um, we had something that's very similar. You, you again have the robot in a field, but now instead of a cyclic permutation, it has the permutation of distance ordering. So in this example, the robot only observes two, one, three, four. It just has those numbers. And as it moves around, it can detect differences in the cyclic permutation. So this shows the robot here, these four landmarks, and these are the different regions where the same cyclic permutation is maintained. So what, what Max Katsev showed was that the, um, the Delaunay triangulation and convex hulls are obtained. So what is the Delaunay triangulation? Um, over here is the Delaunay triangulation of a collection of points. And uh, underneath that is the so-called Voronoi diagram. So inside of, for a collection of points, that would be the landmarks over here, um, each one of these regions corresponds to a zone where this is the closest landmark if you're out moving around. 
And then there's these edges. So the line of triangulation is just the, the edges that connect across these, um, these boundaries between Vorno regions. Um, if you haven't seen Vorno regions before, here's another example, which I thought was kind of funny while I was preparing today for my talk. Um, this is what North America looks like if you, if you make Vorno regions out of the uh, national capitals. Um, so if you want, you can ask your, your um, uh, <clears throat> you, you can ask the, uh, the Mexican president to talk to the U.S. president and propose this maybe as a new uh, collection of borders for North America. It looks like it would favor Mexico very well. So, but uh, anyway, it looks like it would favor Cuba very well as well. So, but anyways, that, that's what a Vorno diagram looks like on North America. I guess one should strategically place their capitals to try to, anyway, that's too much imperialism. Okay, so um, another example is a, a, a paper with um, mainly my student, Jing Jin Yu and, and Daniel Lieber, a control theorist at Illinois, called Rendezvous Without Coordinates. Just another example, but I don't want to explain it too much, but it's more of a pure control problem. But the idea is that you have a bunch of vehicles that need to rendezvous, and they only can tell with their sensor whether or not a target vehicle, this is the second vehicle, this is the first vehicle, it has a windshield and it can only tell whether the target vehicle is inside the field of view of the windshield or not. So it just says, okay, vehicles number 12, 17, and four are inside my windshield and the rest are not. And based on that information alone, we calculate how big the windshield could be, not 180 degrees, but more than 90 degrees. There's some limit that's somewhere in between. And based on that windshield limit, we can drive them all together and have them rendezvous without any of the vehicles ever having coordinate systems or any global coordinate frames. And that's all based on some kind of novel uh, Lyapunov analysis with non-quadratic functions. So it's something Jing Jin Yu came up with some special functions that's very clever in proving this. All right, so let's go to topology. So we're like going another level, even, even weaker or stronger, depending on how you're looking at it. It's, it's an interesting, more fascinating kind of robot if it can get away with such little information. So I'm gonna talk about a simple gap sensor um, in this case, um, the topology is very, very weak in the sense, or what I say, it's sort of boring topology in the sense that it's only the topology of the space in terms of connected components. How many connected components do I have? That's kind of the topologists are much more interested when spaces are sort of twisted and, and there's all sorts of extra structures going on. But I'm not going to cover that for this part. This is just, uh, um, um, let's say, um, a connected components. So if I put a robot here in a 2D environment, it's really maybe has walls, so it's like two and a half dimensional. And then um, it has an omnidirectional visibility sensor. Um, it would look like this if you were to illuminate all of these parts here. But then imagine it's a depth sensor. And then look at the places where there are discontinuities in the depth. If you sweep around from zero to, to um, zero to 360 or, or zero to two pi, and you sweep around, and uh, there's these different discontinuities in depth. And so there are now these different connected components to the depth measurement, and then these discontinuities. So I want to consider what happens if the robot moves and these, conti and these continuities, these discontinuities move along with them. And then there's some topological changes occurring. So this was um, the first version of this work was, was mainly the work of uh, my student, Benjamin Tovar, who was Rafael's student before that. And, um, and also Rafael has continued this, this tradition with a lot of his uh, uh, previous students uh, who, who've all uh, graduated, I think. And um, uh, so that number of papers can continue to extend this. So the sensor observation is just, there's a number of gaps. And again, it's a, it's a cyclic ordering without any angle or distance information. And as the robot moves, um, we want to figure out what we can get away with doing. And so we notice that there's these certain topological changes to the sensor, to the sensor output. So if, if the robots, if the, if the environment's curved, and there's also polygonal versions of this, but if the robot's curved like this, and the robot moves back and forth between these two places, then this, a gap will disappear or appear. And if the robot moves across what's, what's in bi-tangent extension here, then two gaps will split or merge. So that's what we get for that. Um, and then uh, we, we proved, it, which is very strange, that we could grow this kind of uh, tree structure by moving the robot around. So it's a learning problem. And we learn this kind of tree structure that enables the robot to perform distance optimal navigation. It's Euclidean distance, not combinatorial. It's actually Euclidean distance optimal navigation. So the gods looking down above can say for, for these maps that the robot doesn't have, it will do distance optimal navigation on whatever space it's in, even though the robot can't possibly measure any distances. So it really helps you know, explain or characterize this difference between what the robot can get away with doing, and we can prove that, that it can do this without giving it all of this information. I think I can, I think Benjamin's old video may actually play here. Let's, let's see. Of course it did while I was practicing. Now it's, oh, let's give it another try. 
Yay, okay, that thing kind of goes around. So there's this kind of data structure that gets built. And um, um, as it moves around, they have some systematic way of doing that. And then this tree characterizes exactly how the shortest paths are all kind of connected together here. And then if you want to get somewhere where you've already been, you say, okay, I want to go to wherever this red box was. And there could be an object hiding behind it or something. And then it will chase this and chase this and chase this. It chases the gaps and they keep splitting and splitting and splitting until you get to the final gap where you want to go and then it disappears and then you're there. So that's roughly the idea without giving a lot more detail on this talk. I'm giving more of a high level overview. So we did it first for a point robot and then there's disk robot and then differential drive robot that mostly was done in, in Raphael's group at the CMOT there. Oops, no, I don't want to do it again. Okay, let's see. No, I probably broke my system. All right, let's see. Continue to the next thing. Um, we started also looking at gaps in terms of making filters that can count moving bodies. Um, I, I did a number of works back with people at Stanford, like uh, Leo Gibas and Rajiv Motwani. We had a mobile robot project there in Jean-Claude Latom's group when I was a, a postdoc there. And we wondered what would happen if you lost track of the robot and where it would go. And we started reasoning about these shadow regions, which are very closely related to gaps, because each one of these is a gap. And imagine there's these white robots here, and they're out moving around. And then you have these bodies that you're trying to keep track of. And we have hide and seek games you can play. I've, ta I've given talks about hide and seek games that robots play at the CMOS before in previous years or decades, maybe. Um, but um, <clears throat> I think Raphael even remembers he was visiting Stanford in the 90s at the time when we had these robots and we had to have one follow the other with a camera. But um, in, in more recent works, my student Jing Jin Yu, more recent about a decade ago, um, instead of three decades ago, um, did, did this work where um, you have multiple robots, sort of multiple agents, bodies, whatever they are moving around, and you want to keep upper and lower bounds on how many there are lurking in the shadows. Here the shadows are white, so it's kind of strange to have white shadows and dark um, objects and stuff, but that's the way it goes. And, and then you want to keep track of how many there are, and they could be indistinguishable if they're the same color, and that's kind of okay. The system still works, and it will keep tell you how many reds, blues, and greens there are upper and lower bounds in these different regions. So, and it does all of this by, again, tracking these combinatorial changes. So as gaps appear, disappear, or split, and merge, um, it does some very simple integer linear programming. It ends up simple computationally to do so very efficiently. It ends up being a not such a bad integer linear programming problem so, so to handle these changes. Um, and then there was some work as well that uh, Benjamin Tovar and, and, and uh, many several others in, in my group did. Um, also, um, Fred Cohen, a mathematician at um, Rochester University, passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but, um, uh, which basically is if you have a bunch of uh, beam sensors, these are called beam sensors here, and then you have a moving body, like a robot or human or whatever that goes moving around, we figured out what can we reconstruct about the path? Can we calculate the path that this body took as it moved around um, up to homotopy or up to some geometric constraints, like went from this region and then that region and that region? So we figured out the conditions under which you can do that. I don't have the details here, here, but we came up with it. It, it was um, really nice to find the, let's say, minimal sufficient conditions for this. Um, now let's go to the level of set theory. <clears throat> so let's think very generally. So I have sensor mappings and pre-images. I, I, I have sensor mappings in that diagram. Let me go back to the diagram just for, for fun here. So I had, this, I had this diagram and I have the sensor mapping up here. H takes the external to the, to the internal, X to Y. So now we go back to the set theory here. So that's my mapping H. I want to look at what are called pre-images. I'm writing the inverse symbol here, but I don't mean inverse. I want to, I want to really apply this to cases where the inverse does not exist. So this is the kind of pre-image. This notation is common in real analysis, for example. So I want to look at the set of all states that will give me the same observation. Right? And we think about how much uncertainty is being handled here. It's very important and fundamental to sensing to know that your sensor is not measuring everything. The gods can look down to the space of possibilities. And, and, and know that it's not measuring everything. So at, for example, maybe this sensor here is like a, is, maybe the sensor is like a, um, a detection, there may be a camera here pointing down and it can count how many bodies, how many separate agents are, or bodies are in the field of view of the camera, so V for view of the camera. And so if that's the case, then the, um, this partition of X that's induced by the function here, H, there's only five different cases and they're all shown here. There's either no bodies in one, two, three, or four in the field of view, assuming there's four bodies total. If there's not no number of bodies, then you have uh, an unlimited number of classes. Of course, if you're counting humans, there's an upper bound. I think it's, it's 7 billion now or 8 billion, I don't remember. Um, um, another one is I have a depth sensor 
and it just points in a single direction and tells me how far away the wall is. Where could I be in a known environment? Well, it's a two-dimensional set in the plane if you're in a planar environment because you can move back and forth along the wall and that would be the same position. But you can also rotate and move back and forth along the wall, or rotate a little more and move back and forth. So you end up with two-dimensional sheets. Um, oh, I should have added it here. Oh, maybe it's not too widely known yet. Anyway, uh, Danny Halpern and I and a couple of his students have some new uh, papers out, but maybe you can poke around. I think they're on the archive, if you look, that basically do these calculations numerically. Um, so so that, that's, um, you, should, you should take a look at that. I should have had them, one of them here. I forgot it's on archive anyway. Um, now, let's think about comparing the power of sensors, because I want to try to figure out what are the kind of minimal sufficient um, requirements to solve some task. And I want to try to do that in a systematic way. So one thing to do is if I take two different sensor mappings for the same state space, they can have two different observations, it doesn't matter. Two different observation spaces. So I'll say one of them, this is very natural, one of them dominates the other, if and only if it's partition that it induces is a refinement of the other. So for example, um, this H2 sensor here, let's say is, um, is um, which one's dominating here? So let's see here. This, I suppose I have a sensor H2. H1 dominates it because there exists a function G that can take the output of H1 and transform it into output of, of H2. So it's able to simulate H2 using its output. So that makes it more powerful. This can always be done if the partition induced by H1 is a refinement of the partition done by H2. It's just a matter of checking basic definitions of functions, the basic set theory. <clears throat> so I have a paper a couple of years ago uh, that, that introduced this idea of a sensor lattice. And um, the idea is to consider the set of all possible sensors and then say they're equivalent if and only if they induce the same partition. Well, it turns out this forms a, a lattice. Here's a lattice over four elements. It's a very boring lattice. It's very tiny. We want to apply it to entire configuration spaces. And we can. We can define it mathematically. But it's important to understand the structure. So it's a well-known thing called a partition lattice. This is the lattice of all partitions of this set of four elements. And again, we can do this for any set. And in this case, there's an upper bound and a, there's an upper part and a lower part. There's extremal elements. And then each pair of elements has a greatest lower bound and least upper bound. And uh, the least upper bound is the common refinement that you would get by overlaying the two partitions. And it would also be what you would get if you combined those two sensor readings side by side as a vector. And then the, 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 um, the greatest lower bound is something else, a little more complicated, but I, I won't go into it. And now you can think about two general kinds of filters. You have spatial filters, which combine observations from multiple sensors, maybe all at once, or temporal filters, which could be the same sensor operating at discrete stages. And of course, you can mix these, but let's keep them separated for a while. Let's think about an idea of triangulation. And by triangulation, I do not mean breaking a polygon into triangles. That's a more common notion, perhaps, for computer science and video games and things like that. But I mean this idea of trying to do inference or sensor fusion by triangulation. So if I have a number of sensors, then um, the triangulation of a set of observations is the intersection of their preimages. That's what I mean. So I have a number of observations coming in, a vector of them, and I just intersect their preimages. And this um, common intersection here corresponds to what might be possible. And um, it's important to understand that triangulation is, is a refinement of partitions because I'm just, I'm just overlaying those partitions. So I'm moving up in the sensor lattice when I do this. And if I have observations over time, it could be similar. Let me give some examples, stereo vision. So if you just have a pinhole camera model, the pre-image is um, this ray. So the object, the, the image is in the plane here. This is a, kind of a 2D picture of the camera. So it's like a 1D image. And uh, this is the pre-image. And now stereo uh, vision works by having this kind of calibrated pair of cameras. I know where they are in space. So I can figure out exactly where that point is by triangulation, it's the intersection of these two pre-images. But why limit it to cameras? So this ancient idea from the picture here, this Chinese picture, which I gave this talk recently and someone Chinese in the audience, I said, oh, what does this say about triangulation? And they said, it, it mentions that some birds are flying and that's all. So I'm like, okay, so I was kind of embarrassed. Now I'm embarrassed again. Um, so, so we have um, ancient triangulation. You have um, um, the idea is that the angle to two landmarks that you can see remains fixed. So you're measuring it. And then you think about a circular arc of places where you might be standing. That's how the mapping ends up working. <clears throat> and if you don't know which landmarks to the left or right, you have two circular arcs. But most of the time, you only have one. And then you um, intersect. You, you have three landmarks, and you look at two pairs of them, and then you intersect these circles. So all of a sudden, you can do like land surveying kinds of things by, by, by this idea of intersection of preimages. 
You can also do it a method called triliteration. It works, the GPS is based on this, but including three dimensions and time with a 4D version. But, um, but otherwise, triliteration works by just measuring the distance to a tower. You have towers or landmarks here. Each time in the planar case here, you have a circle of, as the pre-image of possible places where you might be. And then you intersect these circles to get um, the unique place where you might be. So the triangulation here is a circular intersection. There's also hyperbolic positioning, which is measuring um, the difference in distances between landmarks. This was done for submarine localization in World War II, for example, that Deccan um, 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 system was used for, for submarines, I think by the British Navy. <clears throat> um, we can bring time into this and we can talk about state time space. So I'll just go kind of quickly with that just to complete the picture of it. So you can have um, z equals state space x cross time interval t. And then you can talk about state trajectories now um, that map from time intervals into the state space. And um, so, so it might look like this, like you have some kind of mapping here, but this doesn't show the precise time parameterization in the state space. So in z space, it looks like this, and now it shows the exact mapping uh, with respect to t. So you can see exactly at what time you're at what states. These are not the same kind of depiction. They're just two different abstractions here. So now I can consider time uh, sensors over space time over the z space. So, uh, so I have the same thing here. I have instead of x goes to y, I have z goes to y. Um, or I can write x comma t goes to y, because z is a Cartesian product, that's fine. And then I can consider pre-images over that. And then I can think about where might I have been, where might this reading have come from in both space and time. So there's all sorts of interesting examples I want to make based on that. And that allows you to take into account delays. And time things over time, you can say, I only know that this measurement came later than that measurement. Maybe that's the only, only the information that you have or that you want to work with when you're trying to make the robot's brain smaller. Maybe you've determined that that's all that matters. That's all you need to know which one came later. So once you have this kind of representation or this kind of mathematical formulation, you can consider these kinds of reductions. <clears throat> and again, you have triangulation over the state time space. So just like you have for the regular state space. <clears throat> um, I think I just had that slide. Yeah, this is again just reminding you of state trajectories. That's this slide again. So I guess it's here twice. And, and then, oh, wait, wait, oh, because I'm doing state time definition in the first place. And then I'm saying I'm going to extend the same idea again now to a space of state trajectories. So I can look at um, history-based sensors now, and I have a space of all state trajectories next tilde, and then I have a history-based sensor mapping. An example of a history-based sensor mapping would be an odometer in your car. It may tell you how far you've driven, but it does not know where you've been. Right? So it's based on the entire history, but you cannot just take an instant reading. You, you can't just, okay, maybe you can look at how worn the tires are and you can try to guess how far the car has been, but it's not a very good estimate. Probably depends on what kind of road you've been on and then how loaded the car has been and what seasons you drove in and so forth. But, but um, so, so really an odometer is a history-based sensor. Well, you can take pre-images over that. And guess what? Once again, you can end up with a sensor lattice over the history. And then you have this very general way of viewing um, <clears throat> filtering um, or doing some kind of reasoning or sensor fusion, let's say, over the spatial trajectories, which is that you started in some state and you ended in some state. And then when you got some sensor readings, the, 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 um, the state must be in the pre-image for each one of these sensors. Um, so it's kind of like having a uh, slalom gates and a ski slope and, and the trajectory is constrained to go through the gates. This would be for um, instantaneous sensors. I've not really given you the, the whole, I can make, I can make history based sensors and then there have to be consistency with respect to those parts as well. It just gets a bit more complicated, but I just wanted to say that this triangulation concept on trajectory space looks like a kind of ski slalom. So generally speaking, these partition lattices <clears throat> give you an idea of how finely the space and what resolution the space can be kind of divided up, whether the space is the state space, the state time space, or even the trajectory space. <clears throat> and then we have this general quest of trying to find the smallest possible information space that can be, um, <clears throat> that is sufficient for doing some tasks that we hopefully formulate very carefully. In this paper I told you about with, um, with my uh, postdoctoral researchers on my team, uh, Weinstein and, and Shakjak, they, they both, um, um, in that case, you formulate very carefully with logic, if you like, um, exactly how you want the task to be solved over the state space, like how it needs to be formulated. You could use linear temporal logic. You can just talk about it as I want to get to the goal region and be done. You can just describe that set and that's all. So however you formulate it, then, then we, we establish that in a very general setting that there exists unique 
minimal um, information spaces or information transition systems, we call them, because it's actually a dynamical system on the information space. And we show that these exist and, and, and they're very closely correspond to moving to the right level, let's say, in these partition lattices. Um, <clears throat> for a while, we got into extreme minimalism. Um, this was done by, by a number of, of students in my group. And there's a recent wafer paper on that and a bunch of more papers. I looks like I okay, I covered some of the other authors here as well. Um, Israel Becerra is, is there, who's at CMAT, as you know, of course. Um, but, but the idea is to give the robot a lot of power and make it do stuff, even if it has very, uh, almost, even if it has no sensing. Like in this case, it just bounces off the walls like a billiard ball. And you can see it actually explores this complicated environment pretty well um, in this silly Python code that I, that I wrote a while back. Um, or does it explore well? Yeah, I, it'll go everywhere. Um, there's a great theorem in this, in this literature on dynamical billiards that says that for almost all polygons and almost all initial conditions, the billiard bounce will hit every open set. And it's in fact ergodic. So it's quite, quite impressive. So if you take a very powerful kind of system like that, that requires essentially no sensing, just enough to make sure that it's bouncing. It can be done mechanically. Then you could do, you could, you could make robot systems that have very tiny amounts of impact. Um, so this is um, from a, a few students of mine, especially Leonardo Bobadilla, um, who uh, was from Colombia. So let's see. And so some, but in this case, we have these, um, we had mobile robots where we want them to go in a patrolling pattern clockwise around this kind of annulus region. And um, they cannot be in the same region together either while they do it. And we implemented this with a, a two-bit information space where uh, there's only four different states. And I don't have time to maybe go over all the details, but it's basically they're in one of them now where one guy is in this region and one guy is in that region and they're separated by the white. So it's just keeping track of one state. In one information state, they're separated by the white. And then this guy's allowed to escape over the red barrier but the white barrier is going to cause it to bounce. So it's like a virtual wall. Eventually, and, that's, and, then, I'll, and then I'll open it up for questions. So um, the idea is don't try to sense every need. And, and, um, and I would say sense only what is needed and forget irrelevant information as early as possible. So clever architectures may be employed some big neural net architecture and then keep tuning the parameters and stuff, you may be able to throw the entire thing out and, and do something much simpler. I'm always thinking about Rodney Brooks's old um, claim in the early 80s. He was critical of this um, strong geometry um, robot motion planning, kind of like the, the Lozano Perez kind of work that I mentioned going back um, all the way back to the late 70s and 80s and the 90s. Uh, but in the early 80s, he was criticizing that work and he, he did this uh, some subsection architecture which um, I wasn't too big of a fan of, but when he started his robotics company, iRobot, and made these, these minimalist robots, I thought, yeah, he, this is really the right thing. I got really fascinated with this. And that's why I got interested in simplicity and bouncing and a lot of minimalism and such. A lot of minimalism ideas I got interested in from Matt Mason and Mike Bergman as well. It was all kind of this MIT clan. Um, but, but Brooks once said, the world is its own best model, which kind of has that feeling of me of like, leave it like it's a big hard drive and you can kind of query what you need. Um, I think in his case, he was doing almost pure sensor feedback, and I would do a little more than that. Um, and I would look for these minimal information spaces. So that's my answer to that. But the, 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 what you should do is in between somewhere. But um, as I said, I think sensing and sensor fusion then must maintain these necessary conditions for decision making. And regarding learning, a lot of it, people interested in machine learning right now, if I don't mention it, people ask me why I didn't mention it. So um, I'll say this Goldilocks principle still applies. Are, are you, are you um, finding the right minimal structures, even in the optimization space? So learning very often looks like an optimization problem for most people. And if it is, that's great. But are you, are you sure the answers in the space you're even optimizing over? There may be a much simpler solution, a much more elegant brain for the robot that you've missed because you had no understanding of what the parameter space of possibilities should look like for that problem. Maybe it only needs to preserve certain topological properties or certain weak geometric properties, and that's all the robot needed to do. And you instead imposed all this extra structure for no reason and then made a big horrendous optimization problem that some nice GPUs can do that have been made by NVIDIA or, 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 or someone else and, and, and then, you're, then you're happy. Um, so so, so and I also sort of found that um, I've been a big fan of computational geometry since I started learning about it going all the way back to Leo Gibas in the 90s and, and when I was working with them. And um, 
I, I think that they're very much interested in minimizing complexity to try to, um, because they're interested in runtime and, well, theoretical runtime in terms of time and space complexity. But it turns out that we're also interested in minimizing this as well and trying to make the robot's brain small. So very often I've, I've found that our work towards minimalism runs into the same kind of data structures. Like these gap navigation trees are somewhat familiar to computational geometers. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, I've seen, we, we, we know this. But, but they come across it for a completely different reason. And they're not trying to prove that a robot can do shortest path navigation using those structures. They were interested in just getting the complexity down of some calculations they were doing, and that's all. So a lot of times they accidentally, let's say for us, they accidentally, they know what they're doing. It's not an accident to them, but for us as a side effect, they happen to stumble upon things that we should have been stumbling upon too. Um, so that my guess is there's many more things like this. Um, here's a final puzzle. I'm not gonna leave it as an open puzzle. I'll solve it for you, but, but, um, but it's just very interesting. So in, in robotics, there's the SLAM problem, the simultaneous localization and mapping. And there's this basic problem called loop closure where um, the robot's moving around, say, in a building, not like the crazy CMET with its, uh, with its uh, ladders and or step stairs and whatever it has. But, but, um, uh, but, but imagine it's like one, one big floor, and then you go around in a loop. And um, maybe the robot has to decide whether or not it's gone in a loop. It's called the loop closure problem. It's about mapping. <clears throat> well, what if, I, if we as gods place the robot into one of two different environments, and, and we, we tell the robot, in fact, you're going to be in one of these two environments. One of them is a circle, and one is a helix that happens to project down onto a circle in the plane. And we let the robot measure X and Y, but it cannot measure Z, which is the elevation. <clears throat> and then there's, we, so we say there's a treasure, a piece of gold, and um, it, it's, it's somewhere in your environment, and you need to go find it. And you don't get to know which environment you're in, and you, you let it move along by some command like theta or something. Say theta is where it's at around the circle or something. So it can change that angle. And um, if, it, if it goes all the way around from zero to two pi, if, if it doesn't find the treasure, then it knows it's in environment B, right? And it has to keep going. And it could go like loop around one time clockwise and then, um, um, then two times counterclockwise and then three times clockwise. It's gotta go more than that, maybe four times. You have to undo what you've done and then go further. You can go back and forth like this. It's very close to what's called the lost cow problem in algorithms. And you can eventually uh, be guaranteed to find the treasure, even if you're in environment B. But task number two is really interesting to me because um, um, suppose I tell you decide whether or not there is a treasure. This feels a lot like what happens in sampling based motion planning. You can't decide. You only can find a path if one exists if you're using deterministic sampling, for example. So, so um, in this case, determine whether or not there's a treasure. Well, if you go around one loop and you don't see a treasure, what do you know? And what you know is very interesting. You can say either I'm in environment A and there's no treasure, or I'm in environment B and there may or may not be a treasure. I don't know. I'm going to keep looking. And I think that's, I think that's really interesting. So somehow there's, a, there's an entanglement between the task and your ability to solve it and SLAM for even such a simple example like this. And it's very closely related to topology because this is the th this is a uh, covering space? This is a universal cover for the um, for the circle here for S1. So this is just a way to take the real number line and cover it on the circle by making this kind of uh, helix. So so there's beautiful topology here, and yet it, it's a very simple characterization of the, the loop closure problem. All right, thank you very much. I'll take uh, questions now. I'm hoping you're still there. <laughs> Dr. Steven, thanks for your presentation. It was really interesting. Now, do you have any questions? In the chat, are there any questions? Okay, if, if Raphael has to ask questions, if nobody else does. <laughs> so, may, may I ask a question? So, so in, in the team that you work with, are there so, so how is the team that you work with? Are there mathematicians? Are there engineers, computational science? I see that there is a bunch of different interesting projects that involve a lot of mathematics and modeling applications. So more or less how, how does it look nowadays, no? Um well for, for me it was it, it's always been a challenge and I think in the early part of my career oh I think I'm having some echo back. Um, in, in, the, in the early part of my career, 
um, I, I was happy to talk to theoretical computer scientists because I was working in computer science departments. I talked to control theorists, uh, people who worked in control and dynamical systems during my PhD time. Um, like Tamara Bashar, the a dynamical game theorist, who I learned a lot from, who was on my PhD committee. But, uh, but then, um, as I became a professor, um, I started met a mathematician, Robert Rice, who was an algebraic topologist who was getting interested in robotics. He wanted to make new kinds of applications of topology for robotics. And then he and I together coordinated, and, and we got the U.S. government to fund us on an $8 million project where we handpicked maybe six or seven mathematicians and six or seven roboticists, and we all got together for four years and worked on very fundamental things in the field. So that was really amazing to be able to do that. Um, after that, I, I learned enough mathematics where I got comfortable um, working with other mathematicians and, and people. And also, you know, there's a close connection to the team at the Raphael as well. So he and his students have been able to do a number of things, um, and, I, and that's been very good. And he has his connections to mathematics as well. And then um, in my current group, I have, um, let's see, I have how many mathematicians? I have a differential geometer coming. Uh, she's coming in a couple of months. I have a, this, the, um, um, I have a, a applied mathematician control theorist, a roboticist. I have a dynamical systems mathematician who, who just works not in control theory, but dynamical systems. I have another mathematician who comes from set theory and logic. Um, and that's the, what the, the first author on the, on the paper um, with this minimal sufficient information spaces. So he's taken interest in that. He's interested in cognitive science as well. I have a neuroscience, neuroscientist slash psychologist. Um, he did his PhD at the Beckman Institute at University of Illinois. So he's here in my group as well. And, um, and maybe another roboticist, a couple of roboticists. Uh, oh, and a, and a computer graphics uh, um, uh, um, and virtual reality researcher as well. So that, that's among postdoctoral researchers on my team here now. So I really strongly believe in getting people together with a very different backgrounds. And, uh, and, and, and it has to be curiosity-driven research. You have to get everyone's curiosity. Otherwise, um, it's very hard to ask a mathematician a question that, that, that makes them curious, you know, to get them excited. It took me many years to learn how to, it's like dangling a piece of candy in front of them. But most of the candy that uh, engineering has to offer is not very tasty to them. So it takes a long time to figure out what's the right kind of way to formulate things that make them excited. Um, and not everyone likes the same thing either, but I'm generalizing a lot, but you have to really understand where mathematicians are coming from to get their attention and get them attracted. It's a very good question, so. Thank you. Uh, Claudia has raised her hand. Hello, Steve, thank you for, for your talk. I was wondering, uh, related to deep learning methods or other learning methods, do you have some intuition on how, I mean, only to hear your thoughts about how to explain what's going on on those models, maybe to get back, to be able to get back some geometric intuition about problems? Yeah. No, I don't really. I, I find the, 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 the trend kind of frustrating in, in some way because um, it, it just, all the, I, I went to a conference, I gave a keynote at the symposium on computer animation, um, which I, which uh, Julian Petzla invited me. So, and it was, I had a wonderful time there, but most of the talks that I sat through were just all deep learning there. And then they're all the same. It's like, okay, you know, we got a bunch of data and we made this architecture and we put the data in and we have these hyperparameters we adjusted and look, it does pretty well. All oh, the foot slips around and does something weird sometimes. It's a known artifact for these kind of things and blah, blah, blah. And then the next paper, you know, and they're all just kind of kind of like that without, it was really hard to understand what's going on. So I, I'm not a big fan of, of, of it's okay to, in some fields if you have nothing else you can do and there's, you have no idea how to model it, then if the model itself is useful, then so be it. If it makes money for a company or whatever it might be. But I feel like in the university where we're trying to understand things, um, I feel like it's getting in the way of that a lot. And I, I fear that younger people just, um, you know, read a couple of blog posts, try some code, and they're ready to go. And um, I was talking with Tomas uh, Lozano Perez recently, and he said at MIT it takes them about six months to deprogram all of the undergrads who come in to MIT to, like, convince them to stop doing deep learning so they can actually start doing research. So um, um, because uh, he said there's a problem, of, he called it monoculture, which is an agricultural term. It's like planting the same crop in the same place every year. And then the soil is ruined, and, and he's very concerned. A lot of people at MIT and everywhere else are very concerned that um, the, the diversity of, of thought is is being kind of um, is kind of eroding away. It's a lot like polarization in politics. You know, the same 
things keep, you know, people go to one camp or the other. And, and it's almost like in, in research, it's like everybody's doing deep learning. It's like, okay, who's doing anything else now? So to try to compare. So um, I think some of these mathematical models will help give us some insights into ideally what's the best that one could ever possibly learn. And then if you go a little bit below that, it's impossible to, to learn because that would, that would be invalid. I would like to still have these kinds of things, but um, it's not popular at this point, <laughs> but that's what I want to do. I have the, the, still this kind of, what do you call it, romantic goal of, um, of wanting to understand things. So silly me. Thanks. Yeah. That's a good question, but I don't know. <laughs> Nobody's recording me, right? So I go, I, I, if I start going off on deep learning, I get worried they're going to come and get me. Um, yes, Rafael has a question now. You have to say. The God has spoken. Who do I do? I have to turn mine off, maybe. How do I? How do we let it so that Rafael can talk? Maybe you can type it in the in the um, in the chat. Um, let me see. Yeah. Or is it the mic? Yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. As Claudia says, maybe it's the microphone in the seminar room. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. very much for Thank you. 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 Well, thank you very much. We hope we, you can visit us soon. You know, the pandemic time is over. So uh, yeah, hopefully we can nice. get back to the Perhaps this time, get some free mathematicians to work with. That'd be great. I know that it's like, um, it's, a, it's a great place to try to attract some so, you know, to, our, to our boring engineering problems. Sometimes I think our problems are pretty exciting. <laughs> Yes, and you know a, a, a question about your your filtering filtering modeling. I was wondering what is the state of this research now? Is are you getting close to get that uh, related to to some control law like a a policy? You know, typically in control theory, uh, you use the estimation of the state to build yeah. a policy, and in this in this uh, framework, I have not seen uh, that uh, output in, in your research. What do you think about it? Is that feasible? Is that interesting? Yeah, well, the, you know, the gap navigation trees was an output, right? It was a planning solution, but it was only one kind of problem, right? And you're right, in the, in the trajectory of work that we did, we, we gave up on that for a while and worked on pure filtering problems, like the passive problem, right? And did minimal information spaces for that. And then I got busy with Oculus and other crazy company stuff. But now that I'm back full time in academia, um, we are getting more interested in that. But the way for paper has some planning stuff, but then we had we had to cut a lot of it out because of the short space. So I'll send you a copy of the IGR version that we should have done in January or so, and uh, should have some general statements about planning as well in it. But, I'm not saying it solves everything, but it's at least a framework that we can prove some things in. And we hope that it's starting to get big enough so that, um, um, I, as I said, I would love to prove that <coughs> the gap navigation trees are, in fact, minimal in the structure. And then we can start relating to different things. And it starts to look like the beginnings of the theory of computation in computer science, you know, where you can do reductions and things like that. I think it would be very nice. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the the bouncing work was supposed to also be active, and we did some of that. But but then again, we I kind of stopped and stopped doing research on that when I did VR. But now I'm getting excited about robotics again. Also, we're applying this to make mathematical models of virtual reality itself. So that's another thing we're doing. I'm funded by the European Union for that for the next five years. Most of my group funded for that. Hi, Steve. Israel here. Hey, Israel. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. I, I was wondering about this minimalist idea in robotics. It, it looks like you have applied this idea mainly in motion planning, but have you 
try to use this idea or what have you done about maybe task planning? Something higher level task like maybe manipulating objects or with a robotic arm or something like that? Yeah, we haven't, you, we have not done anything with manipulation, but um, we, we did with the, um, with the, you know, the weave the wall bouncing stuff, we had some paper that at least converted a task classification in linear temporal logic to one that can be solved in a very small information space. So we, we did that at least. But um, that's not, you know, is that, is that manipulation? Not really too much. So, um, the, the most recent paper that Ali Nellis did in Wafer with Todd Murphy's group has a little bit of manipulation in it. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's from Wafer 2020. Oh, no, I haven't seen that one. Maybe I have. Yeah, so you might want to take a take a look at that on my my web pages at least. Um, but it's yeah, it's, it's theoretical, so it's not like we haven't we've not done something like grasping kinds of things. Now I was very inspired by a lot of the manipulation work that Mike Hurdman and, and Matt Mason did and Ken Goldberg back around their thesis work a long time ago, and uh, and that involves information space and manipulation. And most often it looks like funneling, like peg and hole, you know, funneling, uncertainty reduction kinds of things. Yeah, because the idea is like, well, this deep learning stuff just you throw a lot of data and maybe you apply like these reinforcement learning techniques and you can like, like solve really complex uh, tasks maybe, but on the other hand, well, you have this big, big, big amount of data, right? So maybe you can also like, the question is, can you decrease also the, the, the amount of data that you need, or maybe you just need simpler sensors that just having cameras and RGBG cameras, or something like trying to extrapolate this idea of minimalism, but to solve uh, this, well, this like, notion of task planning. Uh, yeah. It would be nice if that could be done. I just don't know. It's such a complicated black box, the kind of learning methods that people are doing these days. Thanks, Stephen. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Come out and visit. Sorry? Come out and visit sometime. Yeah, well, the, it looks like the pandemic is, is gone, so I hope we will see you pretty soon. Cool. Um, so shall we, are there other questions? No. Dr. Smith, thanks for your time and your asset, our invitation. Okay, thank you, Adriana. Nice to meet you, and thank you for hosting this. I appreciate the invitation. <laughs> nice to meet you, too. Okay. So, um, well, uh, see you the next week. Um, thanks, for, thanks for your assistance. Um, have a good day. Okay, have a good day, everyone. I wish I could go to lunch with you. It would be a lot tastier than mine, but that's okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye.